Now, there's not only signs of truth within the religions, there's also deception. We also find falsehoods within all religions. And sometimes these deceptions can become very, very strong and very powerful. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> I think that, um, that the uh, theory of evolution would be an example of a deception. Uh, the theory of naturalistic evolution, the theory that says that the world came into being simply with a big bang, without any um, intelligence directing that big bang, putting it together, that naturalistic evolution resolves the question of who I am and where I'm going. It becomes a stronghold that prevents people from seeing the truth. Um, so not only are there signs of truth within religions, but also there are falsehoods within religions as well. Uh, and for example, uh, some years ago, when I was working on my PhD dissertation, <clears throat> my doctor's dissertation, I was the friend of a uh, university professor who was also working on his doctor's dissertation. And he was an atheist. And one day we were driving down the road. I was driving, we were together. And I said to him, uh, my friend Ron, I said, when will you become a Christian? No, he said, I never will become a Christian, never, ever, ever. I said, why not? He said, the theory of evolution has proved that there is no God. Oh, I said, really? Yes, absolutely. So I stopped my car and I asked him to make a fist like this. So he made a fist and I said, now open your hand. He opened his hand. I said, do you see what just happened here? command from my mouth to your brain, to your eardrums, then goes into your brain, then informs your hand, make a fist and open it up. It's absolutely amazing what we've seen in the car here right now, that you instruct your hand to make a fist and then it opens the hand, the tendons working, the electrical impulses from the brain, the sound waves going to your eardrum, instructing you to make a fist. Amazing phenomenon we've seen right here in the car. You mean that you really believe that this amazing phenomenon of making a fist and opening your hand happened without any intelligence putting it together? That there's no designer that made your hand to function in this way? You really believe that? <coughs> he said, no, Shank, you're right. There does have to be a designer, a God. How else can we explain the reality of creation all around us with its sophistication and its amazing intricate design. You're right. There must be a God. But I'm an atheist and I will never believe. I said, so you're an atheist in spite of the evidence. Yes, that's right. And he said, the reason I'm an atheist is because I hate my father. If I would believe in God, then there would be moral accountability and I would need to get right with my father, and I will never do that. I want to die hating him. Hmm. I said, you're a university professor, absolutely. And in the classroom, you teach your students that there is no God. That's right. And you tell them that the reason that we know there is no God is that the theory of evolution has proved that there is no God, only naturalistic laws. That's all there is, nothing more than that. Yes, that's right. And you know that that is a lie, that that can't be true, that there has to be a designer. Yes, that's exactly right. I teach the lie, and in fact, in the final examinations, I require the students to answer questions in which they repeat the lie back to me again. And he said, all of us professors are doing that, and we call it academic sophistication. Conversation with an atheistic professor, you know. That within our culture, particularly Western culture, there is a stronghold that has developed, which this Ron Anchek said, we all know is a lie, which says there can be no creator 
because the theory of evolution has proved that there is no God, that it all just happens through natural selection. So my professor walking back and forth on the platform in the university classroom that I took my doctor's program in, she would say, science has proved to us students, science has proved that you're only monkeys, nothing more than a monkey. Scientific proof has demonstrated that that is true. Really? And I would say to her in my essays, answering her back, <laughs> in my essays in the universities, that in, the, in the university examination, I would say, now come, come. You know, God has revealed that we're created in his image. And I believe that. And that makes all the difference in the world. I know I'm not just a monkey. And I'm so grateful for that, you see. That a voice trying to speak into this stronghold as best as I could to invite a consideration of another way, another approach, you see. <clears throat> and so within the religions, we find truth, signs pointing in the right direction, but along with that, there's also signs pointing away from the truth. And sometimes those signs pointing away from the truth become strongholds. They become strongholds. Uh, among the Zanaki people of Tanzania, the Zanaki where I grew up, uh, we experienced those strongholds. As the gospel began to take root among the Zanaki, the gospel um, uh, critiqued some of the practices in the culture which, uh, which the people um, embraced. Uh, for example, uh, the worship of uh, nature gods or female circumcision, different practices within the culture that the gospel critiqued and that really needed to change if people were going to, uh, were going to uh, follow Christ. And so the tribal elders became quite upset about that. And uh, at one point, they actually dug graves to bury my parents in and pronounced a curse upon them. Uh, the grave stayed open. <laughs> uh, the, no one died, which demonstrated to the whole culture that Christ is triumphant above the powers, above these occultic powers, that Christ is supreme, and began to open the door of people to consider the Christian faith in, uh, in ways that we would have found unimaginable. But within the culture itself, we found not only, as I say, an openness to the gospel, but also those powers that sought to resist the gospel as it was coming into that culture. And that happens wherever the church moves forward in mission, that you have opposition as well as truth. Truth and opposition are always in various ways present wherever the Christian message seeks to make its way known. <laughs> We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Uh, so we will pause in the lecture right now for a few minutes to hear questions that participants might have. Yesterday you said that idolatry, um, worshipping the idols, is wrong. Uh, but uh, the Orthodox and Catholic Christians uh, worship um, the icons and other images of uh, uh, Jesus Christ or um, other saints. Uh, what do you think of it? Of it? Uh, a, very, a very good question. Um, the uh, use of icons in the Orthodox Church, as I understand it, is to help to direct us towards God. Uh, we have talked about signs within cultures pointing us to God. And as I hear the Orthodox explain the meaning of icons, uh, they say these are signs pointing to God. That's what they are about. Now, as you know, within the worldwide Christian community, there is much discussion about that. And some people would say, be careful. Perhaps the icon has become uh, an object of actual worship, that it's not just a sign. That's an area for discussion among Christians. Generally, Protestants 
are more hesitant about uh, icons than is true of other communities like Catholic and Orthodox. So that's a conversation within the Christian family. Um, I come from a church where we have uh, no images at all, uh, feeling that they may take us away from the true worship of God. The image itself might become most important. But I know I have Orthodox friends who interpret it differently, and we try to respectfully listen to one another about that concern. But the Bible is very clear, certainly, that to worship the image as a divinity, uh, as an expression of divinity, is, uh, is something that the Bible is, uh, is uh, very clear in warning us not to, not to let, not to in any way permit anything to get in the way of worshiping God himself. Okay. Uh, my question is about Africa, and I want to know how do you uh, echo the practice um, there? Christians. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. And in the next section, I will talk particularly about occultic practices. But occultic practices are not just an African concern. They are worldwide. Whether you go anywhere in the world, particularly within tribal religions and national religions, you find occultic practices are present uh, today. I want you to give a special presentation about that a little later on. A good question. Uh, you have a very interesting suit. Uh, where is it from? And what is the story connected with oh, it? Oh, a very nice question. As you well know, I've said it many times, I grew up in Tanzania among a tribe known as Zanaki. The president, the first president of Tanzania came from that community. And he wore a coat like this. Julius Nyerere was his name. Prime Minister Nehru of India, also the first prime minister of independent India, also wore a coat like this. So in East Africa, they were called, uh, they were called um, uh, Nyerere jackets. And in India, this jacket was called, this coat was called a Nehru coat. So I often thought I would like to get a coat like that sometime because Nyerere was a very special person that I, I thought I would like to have a coat like he had sometime. So when I was visiting uh, New Delhi, India, a couple years ago, my host told me, come downtown. So they took me downtown to a, uh, uh, a shop where they made coats and they cut it out for me and gave me one. So it's a gift from Indians to me a coat that I always hope to have sometime, and it reminds me of Nyerere and Nehru, whom I have high respect for. Thank you for the question. I like that question. <laughs> so I wear it only on very special occasions like being with you these days. 